Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Sterling Live. My name is Caitlin Brower, and I am Sterling Social Media Manager. And today I am joined uh, by Allison DeWolf and Don Montron. I'm so excited to have the two of you here today. And we will be discussing due diligence investigations without FCRA boundaries. So this is just a reminder to our audience that we do go live every single Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern across Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So again, Allison and Don, I'm so excited that you're here joining us today. So can you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves to the audience? Um, Allison, we can start with you. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison DeWolf. I am uh, Vice President of Investigations at Sterling. I head the due diligence group here. And I've been in the investigative industry for about 13 years, the last 11 of which I've been with Sterling. Thank you. Don, can you go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Hi, my name is Don Montrand. I've been, I'm a uh, senior investigative analyst with the pre-investment due diligence team. I've been with Sterling for about five and a half years um, in, in, the, in the industry for almost 10. Um, and uh, yeah. No, oh, that's great. So our audience listening right now, you're in for a treat today. We have a great episode with some lead investigators with us right now. So this is just a reminder, though, we will be asking Allison and Don a bunch of questions on our end. But if you across Facebook, LinkedIn or YouTube have any questions for them, please go ahead and type your question in the comment box and I will hand off those questions to these two and we will get them answered for you. So let's go ahead and get started. So I want to provide our audience with an overview of due diligence. So Allison, I do have a couple of questions for you. So I have three big ones. So we'll hit all of them. Well, we'll hit them separately. So my first question is just an overview. So what is due diligence? Yeah, so due diligence is essentially undertaking research efforts to determine the risks associated with entering into a business partnership, um, an investment or a loan, or really any kind of business deal. That was great. So why is it important for, for organizations? Well, I think it's an important tool in the business world. It's really used to kind of help mitigate a company's risk with engaging in another firm or person who may have sort of underlying um, reputational issues or an unsavory past. And it can really provide important context um, about how that person or company may behave or take action in the future. So through these investigations, we're really looking into many different aspects of a person or a company's background, such as their work history, um, business affiliations, their educational and licensing credentials, um, their legal and regulatory sort of footprint, mm -hmm. as well as um, sort of assessing their indebtedness. So we review, you know, credit records, um, determining the existence of bankruptcies, judgments, liens, and we look at their, you know, real estate assets um, and holdings. So to wrap up the overview of due diligence, we talked about what it is, um, you know, why is it important? So who actually needs due diligence? Well, I, honestly, I think anybody who is looking to do sort of a risk assessment of right the people and companies are going to be doing business with or, you know, entrusting large sums of money or assets. Our clients tend to be a little bit more weighted in the financial services industry. Um, we primarily have clients in sort of um, asset managers or asset allocators, private equity firms, um, mm -hmm. venture capitalists, uh, pension funds and endowments. Um, really any kind of individual or firm that's looking to close a deal, whether it's a merger or acquisition or, you know, a business loan or real mm -hmm. estate investment. So, but we also, you know, service a lot of other different clients right. in many other industries. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of work for them to, you know, vet, uh, partnerships and vendors. 
Um, these include, you know, multinational corporations, consultancy firms, um, law practices, as well as a lot of smaller businesses. So, you know, while we're engaged in, um, you know, the investment and pre-investment world, um, whether it's before a, a fund launching or private equity investment, mm -hmm. we also assist our clients with other types of, sort of deals and um, transactions like franchising, uh, commercial leasing. Um, and we also provide support in litigation matters like uh, the recovery of assets. So I think it's interesting that you brought up small businesses. I don't think my mind was going there at all. Yeah. Are there any particular like small businesses that um, we do support with this? We do a myriad of different um, small businesses in all types of industries. Mm -hmm. So it really kind of runs the gamut. Um, and a lot of it has to do with just sort of vetting, um, you know, the personal relationships that they're going to be engaging with from a professional standpoint. Mm -hmm. So vendors yeah. and, and those types of things. No, that was great. Thank you. And I thought the overview just in general was was really good and really informative. So as Sterling and, you know, we are a background screening and identity services organization, if you've been coming on to Sterling Live each week, you know, we talk a lot about background checks, background screening, our COVID-19 health testing. We're talking about a lot of things here. So I really want to dive in, though, to the differences and maybe there are some similarities, too. Um, but, you know, a background check versus due diligence um, investigation. So Don, I wanna ask you some questions here. Um, so I do wanna walk through the difference between the two. Um, and then I do also have that question of, are there any similarities? So I'll go ahead and hand it off to you here. Thank you. Well, of course there's similarities. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the obvious difference is the scope and the purpose of the investigation mm -hmm. itself. Um, a standard background check is meant to confirm the subject is who they say they are. Did they graduate from the school listed on the resume? Um, is the no box accurate when they check? Um, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Um, our due diligence investigations not only try to confirm these questions, but they also seek to uncover information not disclosed by a subject mm -hmm. or a business entity. Um, what is the subject not telling us or omitting from the resume? What information is the subject hoping that we won't discover? Um, what about checking the boxes? Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're not about checking the boxes. We're about looking at uh, painting a full picture. Right. Um, because Sterling Diligence operates as a licensed private investigations firm. We are not subject to state and federal regulations such as the FCRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. This allows us to have a few more tools in our toolbox in order to provide a full story to our clients. Um, for example, there's no limitations on the information we can report and we can include things such as felonies more than seven years old, yeah. uh, misdemeanors, and even arrest records that did not lead to a conviction. Uh, we also have no restrictions on how far back we can report this information. Uh, civil, lit civil litigation going back even 15 mm -hmm. to 20 years if it's available. Um, we also have the ability to undertake investigations either discreetly or overtly, uh, meaning with or without the individual's or company's knowledge or consent. Um, I do think the, the, the biggest different, uh, difference is the presentation and the analysis of the information that we do mm -hmm. collect. Um, we research and review hundreds of documents for every yeah. investigation. Uh, we have a team of expert analysts that review each piece of information collected um, and those data points to identify and highlight patterns as well as point out anomalies in a person's um, or company's background. Um, for example, if, if, if a company is very litigious and they sue to contest contracts that they've entered into, um, these data points paint a, uh, an illustrated an underlying issue of integrity, such as not willing to live up to an agreement or uh, a blatant disregard for the rules. Um, while we, it's not our job to draw conclusions about these things, you know, mm -hmm. our goal is to make sure that we provide as yeah. much information to our clients as possible to, uh, to paint that very comprehensive picture uh, for each subject in order to add important context for our clients to make their own informed decisions. Yes, I think that's a great point to kind of like sign off on there that it's not our job to come to a conclusion, but giving our clients all of the information they need to move forth and make decisions on behalf of their organization. So I thought that was a great point um, to end on there. But I thought something that was super interesting that you had mentioned, and maybe our audience is kind of thinking about, about it too, that we don't necessarily need the consent from an organization or an individual. So can you actually explain that a little bit more, you know, why we actually may not need that? 
Sure. Um, like I said, because we're not bound by FCRA regulations, um, we can begin a due diligence investigation mm -hmm. with as little as a subject's name. Um, because of the special licenses that we have as a private investigative firm, we have access to all kinds of personal identifying information that'll allow us to pull the records that we need, um, track down a subject's former jurisdictions, you know, where they've worked, where they've lived. Um, this allows our clients to request discrete investigations for, you know, maybe deals that might be in the pipeline, things that they're not quite sure about yet. So it's an, it's a nice tool to have. Hmm. No, that's great. So with like, you know, tools like this and having these regulations or not following certain regulations, things like that. Um, obviously it looks like it's super important to, you know, engage with a partner that can do everything like this. So engaging with an, a partner like Sterling uh, to start an investigation, let's dive into that a little bit more. So Allison, when would someone need to engage um, in a, you know, a partner like Sterling uh, to, under, um, to undertake an investigation? Well, I would say certainly before any deals are done, yeah. <laughs> but um, the earlier the better. So you know, given the amount of research and analysis that goes into these investigations, I would suggest probably several weeks or even months mm -hmm. before you go to close or kind of handshake a deal, um, especially if there's um, an international component to the investigation. Many sort of uh, remote regions can take a little while to kind of collect mm -hmm. that information, which, you know, understandably can be very challenging, especially during COVID times. Um, I'd also strongly advise against waiting to take action, um, like waiting until you have that gut feeling about something, um, or, you know, even worse after you've already been, um, harmed or embarrassed by a right. relationship or an affiliation with a bad actor. Um, unfortunately too many of our clients kind of end up coming to us after a major event, um, in which they got burned. So for example, yeah. we, um, there was a multinational uh, Sterling uh, corporate client that recently sought our team's expertise in doing um, due, due diligence research on a number of companies in the US. Um, and that was after their current vetting protocols had failed to identify a company they hired in the US to transport fuel, um, which ended up in uh, that company actually stealing about six million dollars worth of gasoline from them. So wow. I guess, you know, the, the moral of the story mm -hmm. here kind of thing is, uh, you know, due diligence shouldn't really be introduced um, into your decision making process on a case by case basis, but rather um, sort of heavily integrated into your business decision making processes. Yeah. So Don, you had mentioned before that, you know, we can start, you know, with just like someone's name, um, start the investigation process. But Allison, I, I am wondering, and I'm sure our audience is too, you know, what are the other kinds of information that you need or what is required to begin a background investigation? Yeah. So I'll just kind of piggyback off what Don said. You know, we really do need very minimal information to initiate an investigation mm -hmm. um, for individuals obviously a name and a location. Um, bios and resumes are also very helpful, especially with those common name um, individuals. You know, similarly for companies, uh, you need the company name and some basic location or other information. If they have a website or like a LinkedIn page, mm -hmm. but it just kind of goes back to that sort of initial concept we had, which is, you know, it's the act of sort of discovering information versus just confirming information provided by a client or a subject. Um, so that's really sort of the nature of what we do. Is there any information that's, you know, maybe not helpful or won't push the investigation, you know, as further along as it could be? Um, not really. I would say the more information, the, the better. better. It kind of kickstarts <laughs> our investigation yeah. a little bit more quickly. Um, and we can kind of zero in, in that on that individual or company a little bit more mm -hmm. quickly. Um, but otherwise, no, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, we really need minimal information to get started, but the more the merrier. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, no, I can definitely see that for sure. So you mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, not coming when something has already happened or just like giving a lot of time before an investigation, you know, to get things started properly. Yeah. Um, and you you briefly touched upon, uh, upon international uh, investigation. So um, I, I'm wondering, what are our capabilities outside of the United States when it comes to um, these due diligence investigations? Yeah, so Sterling Diligence actually has very robust international capabilities um, and can conduct investigative efforts in just about every country and jurisdiction in the world. Um, we can get to any kind of remote region in the world. Mm -hmm. We have very long standing relationships with our investigators on the ground in all parts of the world, and we meet with them often. You know, we vet them and their knowledge and connections are really unmatched in, in the industry. Can you explain um, what investigators on the ground mean? So what's the difference between the two of you being lead investigators yeah. and then ones you have on the ground? Sure. So we have a network of um, investigators that we use um, in, again, all places in the world. Mm -hmm. They tend to be, you know, private investigators like we are. Um, some of them are, um, you know, prior or veteran police or military officers or journalists in remote areas. Um, so it's really a wide network yeah. of, of individuals that we utilize for sort of more the boots on the ground type of work. Yeah, no, that's definitely, definitely helpful to know. So I think a lot of times our audience, um, it, it really benefits from uh, prime examples. So examples from, you know, our clients, case studies, things like that. Um, so Don, I want to hand it off to you for a little bit more. So I know, Allison, you, you did provide a great example before, but, you know, some more, uh, some more client stories here. So do you have an example of, you know, when one of your clients benefited from going a little bit deeper, you know, taking that extra step with an investigation? Of course, yeah, lots. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, the best one, the best one. <laughs> um, and, and, and it also goes to the difference between, you know, your standard mm -hmm. background check and, and our due diligence investigations. So we did have one subject who was identified to have a minor citation in a county court um, criminal filing for public drunkenness, for which he pled guilty and, and paid a small fine. Um, but because, you know, with the experience that we have, we know that many criminal cases have been pled down and the final result is not always what you see in the original, in the original charge. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular case, our investigator contacted the arresting agency to obtain a copy of the arrest record. Um, what we were provided with was details of the incident, which portrayed a much more serious situation. Right. Um, originally, the police had been called to, to this individual driving drunk. When they arrived on the scene, the subject had already crashed his car into a pole and was exiting the vehicle. Clearly inebriated, um, he had lost control. He had vomited all over himself and in the mm -hmm. car. Um, he then became belligerent and spit on the officer uh, while resisting an arrest and a, a blood alcohol test. Um, we then, because of this specific incident and the details that it provided, we then took a closer look at some other minor mm -hmm. citations that had been issued uh, to this individual and pled down. And what we were able to uncover was a long pattern of alcohol-related arrests, wow. yeah. which we were then able to present to our client. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's why we think it's really important to obtain as much detail surrounding even the most benign court filings as, as we can. Mm -hmm. um, our team of invest investigators are trained to know how to track this information down and uh, so that our clients are provided with not just the end result, but the key details leading up to a court case, um, which if revealed can sometimes paint the subject in a much more negative light than just the end result of a data dump would. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very interesting. <laughs> I'm just taking it all in right now. Like that's a very, very prime example there. Um, so we do have a question on LinkedIn, uh, but I do want to get both of your thoughts on this. So the question is as follows. Sterling is an industry leader in diligent investigations as much as background checks. With the extensive experience amassed over the years, what are the changes you've seen in diligence investigations? So Allison, I'll, we'll start with you on answering that. Yeah, I would say a couple things. One big one is the frequency in due diligence that you that you see. Um, I think, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it wasn't as much of a part of everyday uh, business transactions in life as it is today. Um, 
I think part of that is has to do with um, incidents like Bernie Madoff and those type of big kind of uh, exposures of of not doing your due diligence and what and what can happen um, in the industry, especially the pre investment financial services industry. Um, we do see uh, consent and investigations that are happening at a much more frequent uh, frequent pattern. Um, so that's another sort of indication that it's just becoming mm -hmm. more and more part of people's like daily routines and daily um, daily transactions. Yeah, no, that's um, that's a great overview into things. So, Don, do you have anything to add um, in regards to the changes that you've seen in diligence investigations? Absolutely. The the amount of tools and the scope of information that we have access to mm -hmm. has, you know, even in my 10 years in the industry has just exploded. We have, yeah. you know, right at our fingertips access to, you know, regulatory matters from all over the world, um, global sanctions, you know, uh, criminal records, uh, both domestic and international. So the, the the amount of tools in our in our toolbox has definitely grown, um, even in my you know short ten years in the industry. Yeah, so I thought that was a great question. Um, you know, if you are watching on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, please feel free to keep the questions coming. I really thought that one was great, and you guys uh, had phenomenal answers to it for sure. So I do want to kick back to what we were discussing prior to the question, and that is client stories, case studies, things like that. So back to you, Don. Do you have any more examples of you know recent uh, you know cases that you've you know recently worked on that have you know really stuck out to you? Yeah, um, another one uh, we had recently, um, uh, our investigators were able to make some connections um, when a domestic violence case was uncovered um, in the US mm -hmm. revolving, uh, uh, um, revolving around a subject. Um, once the copy of the incident report was requested, uh, the officer had a small handwritten note in the margins mentioning something vaguely about uh, the Niagara Falls arrest. That's That's all it said. So, you know, despite having no known ties to that jurisdiction, the subject, um, we made a query with the Niagara Falls Police in New York and found no records of anything. So um, the we then contacted the police on the Canadian side um, who told us about an incident in which the subject was arrested a few days prior, which um, happened while he was on a vacation. Um, without getting into the details, mm -hmm. this Canadian incident uh, really painted an, a very ugly picture of this individual uh, with a very violent history. Um, right. And, and you know, as is the case before, it allowed us to present a pattern of arrests and abuse that we were able to uncover throughout, you know, once once you start pulling at that thread, you you never mm -hmm. know what, what might what I, might unravel from it. So um, just, you know, going that extra mile and wow. retrieving primary documents from agencies allows us to present a pattern to our clients that may not have otherwise been discovered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, another um, prime example for sure. Um, and just kind of really opens up like to the importance of doing investigations like this. And also early on too, like you had mentioned before, Allison, like really starting starting the process, uh, you know, as soon as you can. So we do have another question from LinkedIn. Uh, so thank you to our audience. Please keep sending in questions if you have them. Um, again, would like the, um, the thoughts from the two of you and please feel free. So this is kind of, this can be overarching for Sterling in general but I do also want the Sterling Diligence spin on it. So the question is, what separates you from other background check companies? So again, let's look, you can look at it from an overview, um, but please also, I want the, the Sterling Diligence spin on things as well. So Don, do you want to go ahead and get us started on this question? Sure. Um, like like we've you know touched on before, we are not going to simply report the final results of what we find. It's not a data dump. Um, our investigators will pick at every thread we can, you know, make every phone call, retrieve every document, analyze thoroughly um, mm -hmm. every piece of information we find. Every step of the investigation is handled by an analyst with uh, uh, an investigative analyst with years of experience. That was great. Allison? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, second that um, as well. I think we also have, as I mentioned before, just really, really long standing ties with a lot of really dedicated, um, experienced investigators all over the world. So I think compared to other um, firms in the industry, we, we're we sort of top notch when mm -hmm. it comes to our um, investigative capabilities outside of the US in addition to mm -hmm. um, inside the US. 
Yeah, that global aspect is is very important. I'm, I'm happy you noted that there. So I do want to take a moment again um, to let our audience know, please uh, send in some questions if you have them on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. You just go to the comment section, comment your question, and we can have both Allison and Don answer them. As we do wait for some final questions, though, I would like some final thoughts from the two of you. <laughs> so um, just finalizing everything here. So um, let's go ahead, Allison. Can you please kick us off with your final thoughts from our conversation today? Sure. Yeah, I just think, um, you know, partnering with a company like Sterling Diligence um, is a really important piece to sort of protecting your business interests and investments and reputation. So, you know, the diligence team is here to help and answer any other questions you guys have. So you can also visit our website at www.sterlingdiligence.com for, you know, more information or just to get in touch with us. Perfect. Don, final thoughts? Yeah, I know I mentioned a couple of specific criminal matters in my spe uh, specific examples, just because they're the most fun. Mm -hmm. But um, it is important to get a full and clear picture of, you know, all records that are out there, including mm -hmm. civil records or any bankruptcies that may relate to a subject. Um, have they previously been involved in former litigation with uh, previous business partners? History of bankruptcy? Have they ever been investigated by the SEC? Um, so we really want to reiterate the importance of making sure a due diligence investigation is a part of any investment deal and not just a part of it, but a, mm -hmm. an early part of that decision making process in order to identify any potential red flags as soon as possible. Oh, that's great. And you guys wrapped us up here today perfectly. We had mm -hmm. such an amazing conversation. I know we're on Sterling Live week after week, and we're talking a lot about background screening. We're talking a lot about the verticals that we support, the industries, things like that. This was such an interesting conversation, though, to really sit down and dive in to due diligence, dive into Sterling diligence, the capabilities and what we can offer as a partner. So I want to thank the two of you so much for joining me today. Um, for our audience watching right now and on demand later, we do go live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern across Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So we hope you can join us at the next Sterling Live. Again, Alice and Don, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to our audience for joining us too. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.